Welcome to worship this morning. It is great to see you who have gathered into the sanctuary, and we want to welcome you who are worshiping at home or on the road. We are so glad that we can be here together. I have a couple of announcements. Uh, it's probably no surprise to you that today is Super Bowl Sunday. How many people are watching for the game? You all have who you're going to root for. You know, I'm from Pennsylvania, so you can figure that one out. And uh, how many people are rooting for the commercials? Yeah, I'm curious. And how about the food? The dips. Yes. I love asking several of you what you were making today, and now I am wanting to come to each of your homes. <laughs> Because, you know, Ash isn't here, so I could, I could kind of do that. Anyway, um, if you have ordered sandwiches um, in the little box lunch, they'll be available for, to, for you after worship. And um, if you haven't paid, you'll need to pay with, a, uh, with cash or a check. And uh, Megan or, and her crew will be out there. The Lent study that will begin February 26th, uh, is in person, but there's also an option for online if you're not able to be here in person. If you are interested in studying online for a Zoom study, please contact email uh, ryan at communications at gvumc.org, or you can go online and there's a form there that you can fill out for that. So uh, you'll need to do that soon. And that reminds me that we will be having Ash Wednesday like we had last year. It will be in the fellowship hall uh, beginning at 9.30, and it's a prayer walk that you go at your own pace, and uh, there'll be stations for you to go through the Lord's Prayer, and at the end I will be there to impose ashes on your forehand, forehead or your arm, whichever uh, is best for you. As we continue our series of the, of the Sermons on the Mount, um, I pray that, that your hearts will be opened and that you will experience God's grace. And so as, as Donovan plays uh, the prelude just now, may you pause May you find your breath, and may you know that God is as close to you as your breath. Know that God is here with us.
Good morning. My name is Joe Patsy, and it is my pleasure to be your liturgist this morning. Please stand as you are able for our call to worship. Are you awake? Are you alert? Christ is coming into our lives in a new way. Are you watching the signs? Are you interpreting what is happening today? Christ is coming into our lives in a new way. Do you see opportunities for ministry? Do you see the poor, the homeless, the hungry, the needy? Christ is coming into our lives in a new way. Come and let us worship and let us work in the reign of God. Christ has extended the invitation. Let us work together in the reign of God on earth. And I invite you to remain standing as you are able as we sing our opening hymn this morning, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Why. Our psalm of the day is Psalm 46, verses 1 through 7. Happy are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Happy are those who keep his decrees, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong but walk in his ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous ordinances. I will observe your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me.
So I want to invite kids to join me here at the steps. <clears throat> Hi, Ezra and Eli. Come on down. How are you, Ellie? Good. Good to see you. You can sit right here so I can see you, okay? So are we cold today, Eli? No, you're not cold? Not no? I hear it's going to get colder. I'm not so super happy about that. But we take what it, are you fine? Good. We'll take what it comes. So, you know, today I was trying, to, or this week I was trying to think what I was going to have share with you today. Because I know that Valentine's Day is this week, right? And we talk about love. And do you have to have, do little Valentines for everybody in your class? Um, no. No? Okay. That's changed. You don't like Valentine's Day. You know, my grandson, who's your age, does not like it either. He's refused. I don't know what's that about. We'll have to, like we'll have to, to you know, like, friend. you like to be his friend? I bet you guys would be hilarious together. <laughs> but I just, do you like Valentine's? No? Yes, yes Ezra? Like the, the love, the, no, yeah, okay, the love part. Yeah, the crush moment. The, you don't like that part? Okay. Well, you know, here's the scoop then. Maybe it's good I'm not doing that. But I want to say something. And it was interesting because um, Miss Lindsay chose the song that we just sang. It was about giving thanks to God. I think one of the most loving things that you can do with anyone. Can I hold that for you? I think the most loving thing that anyone can do for someone is to say thank you after they have done something for you. We say thank you to God, right? We say thank you that God has blessed us with many things. So, you know, you could have, I, probably your parents or grandparents have said to you, what do you say? Please. Please, right? And then you have to say thank you. And it's a very important thing to learn, but I bet you that it comes from right here, right? You have... You're saying it because they ask you to say it. Today, I want you to think about having it come from your heart to really mean it, okay? I want that to be your challenge this week so that you can tell your friend when your friend is playing with you, say, what's, your, what's a friend's name? Do you have a friend, a name of a friend? Um, imagine. Imagine. Say, imagine. Thank imagine. you. Thank you. Thank you for playing with me. Thank you for being my friend. You know, I have a friend back in, in Pennsylvania, and every time we're done talking, we say, thank you for being my friend. And we're big grown-ups, right? But it makes our hearts feel really happy when the other person says that. Hi, come on down, Claire. And so we're, we're talking, Claire, about saying thank you to people to your parents, to your grandparents, to your teacher. If you would say to your teacher, thank you, what's one of your teacher's names? Mm, Ms. Shelburne and Ms. Roberts. I Ms. Mean, Roberts. I mean, um, Ms. Robards. So if you would just say thank you, Ms. Robards, I bet their heart would just be warmed. Now, you don't want to say it obnoxiously. You want to say it, that you really mean it. And... So who's going to try it to this week? You're going to try it with somebody? Yeah? Even the grown-ups. I bet if we said thank you to the person at the cashier that does our, our um, uh, goes, you know, our the groceries. Help the adults, then the adults could say thank you to the children. That is right. Exactly. We say thank you to people who have blessed us. All right. Let's pray. Thank you, God. Thank you for blessing us with friends. I thank you for blessing me with these wonderful kids who, who teach us. And I pray that you, your spirit would spark in our hearts to take the time to say to our friends and to our teachers and to all the people that are caring for us that after we receive their blessing that we say, thank you, thank you. Because of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Ooh. Thank you. You're welcome.
Our gospel reading this morning is from Matthew, chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him. Or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. 
But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. So one of my favorite preaching professors warned us not to have too much stuff in our sermon. He suggested that when we read over our sermon drafts to get out a pair of scissors and to just cut out the bits that didn't belong or could be, um, be distracting. He said, oh, I know you think your sermon is great. And no doubt it is, but take care not to be too enamored by your ideas that you uh, keep that filler in and that covers up the gems the Spirit desires for you to share. So in today's sermon from Jesus, it seems that Jesus didn't have the same professor that I had for, for preaching All of those you have heard it was said, but I tell you statements, may have seemed that Jesus was against their, the disciples' holy scriptures. So for us today, to better understand what uh, Jesus is saying, it would be helpful for us to look back at the end of last week's scripture where Jesus said, Don't get me wrong, and I don't want you to leave this mountain thinking that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. No, I have come to fulfill them. I'm not saying that you can ignore what our scriptures say, nor do away with them. What I'm attempting to say and do while I am with you here on this mountain and throughout my time is to make sense of these laws Moses taught us. I want you to understand their deeper meaning so that you can put them into practice. Now, the religious leaders, Jesus went on to say, have taught you to fear the law, and yet... They have not been truly righteous. Your way of living, my friends, needs to go way beyond that of the religious teachers and experts of the religious law. And then Jesus gives them this whole list of examples. You know the law, do not kill. Well, I want you to think about this in a deeper way. Take care not to lose your temper with anyone. Don't go around calling someone a crazy moron or even a dumb turkey. The bottom line here is to take care of your relationships. Make peace with those who you have offended. Know that your thoughts may not kill physically, but they will not help build loving relationships. Secondly, the law concerning adultery is more than just not having casual indiscriminate sex. Rather, know that relationships begin within your heart. Don't think of people as objects to be controlled. And Jesus then continues on, listing more common laws and expanding them, explaining how following these laws begins from within. 
begins with our motivations, our thoughts, our heart space. With each of these laws, Jesus Jesus says in a very broad way, focus on what is loving. Choose love. Jesus is showing them and us today that interpreting the law is more complex than we make it out to be. It's not just a list of rigid rules to be memorized. And so take care that you interpret the laws in a way that leads to life. Make sure your thoughts and your feelings and your actions, all of that are loving. And so do no harm to anyone. And know this, your love for neighbor will be threatened when anger, judgment, and insult are commonplace. And know that your love for neighbor is threatened when women, men, and children are constantly uh, reduced, consistently reduced, even discarded based on their capacity to satisfy privileged and patriarchal needs. And know this, that your love of neighbor is threatened when you don't follow through with oaths and promises you make. Don't just memorize those laws or be super proud that you follow them in a public way. But consider this. Consider that our first thought generates a second thought, which becomes intentions. And intentions form motivations, and our actions then follow. So attend to your thoughts. Right choices begin from right thoughts and always be choosing love. Now, I have a little seminary for our Sunday morning. In theology, there are three orthos. Orthos is Greek for right or correct. Orthodoxy, orthopraxis, and orthopathy. Orthodoxy, you can see the circles there. Orthodoxy is right theology. Orthopraxy is right practice, actions. And orthopathy is right affections, the matters of the heart. Now, theologians and seminarians and even church people in their Sunday school classes like to discuss which of these three orthos is the most important. Which is the top of the three. It's safe to say that the religious leaders in Jesus' day felt that right theology or orthodoxy was most important. Folks who see doctrines and scripture in a literal way and focus on carrying out biblical laws value orthodoxy over orthopraxy or orthopathy. People who, who value orthodoxy too highly are very rigid in their beliefs. From the beginning of John Wesley's ministry, John Wesley is the founder of Methodism, John Wesley had, was very keen on balancing orthodoxy and orthopraxy, bringing them together. That belief alongside of action is where we need to blend, and that our, that our belief and our action will mirror each other. We not only believe that we are called by God as a directive to love our neighbor, but we then need to actually show our love through our actions, our words and our actions. So what about orthopathy? Right affections or right heart space? Author and pastor Reverend uh, Roger Woolsey noted, right affections matter. Our heart space matters. As the old swing era hit put it, it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. And my friends, love is that swing. 
We can meditate, pray, go to church, get baptized, take communion, read our devotions every morning, diligently follow the Ten Commandments, serve on numerous committees, feed folks at friends in the desert, sing in the choir and play the bells, and maybe fix the doors in the church property. But if we aren't doing this with love, Woolsey says, it's a bunch of vapid, empty horse apples. Those are his words. If you know what horse apples are, you get the point. Orthopathy, however, is not just feelings, and not everyone will or must experience a feeling. John Wesley came to understand in his ministry the necessity of having right affections. For Wesley, right affections meant having the fruit of the Spirit character being one who exudes the fruit of the Spirit, allowing the Holy Spirit to transform us so that we integrate love, joy, peacemaking, gentleness, self-control, hopefulness into our lives. This meant that we would love God and neighbor and ourselves in a fully integrated way reflecting the divine image that we are created to be. Whereas the Pharisees focus on meticulously complying with the letter of the law, Jesus is less worried about how many religious boxes that we check off. You know those boxes, like, read my Bible, check, Gave 10% of my paycheck, check. Said hello to the pastor after worship, check. Went to the Sunday school class and church three times this month, check. Rather, Jesus cares intently that you and I are growing in love and peace, justice and mercy. So we need to pause regularly pause and ask ourselves, where is my heart today? Or where is my heart in this moment of time? Where's my affection? In this passage of scripture that Joe read to us, Jesus desires to free his followers, you and I, to free us to live a fulfilling life that is focusing on love rather than on the law. This message doesn't really make our life easier, but by choosing love, our lives, my life, your life, our lives collectively will be more fulfilling. All, of, all around us, it's hard not to see the effects of anger, lust, broken relationships, greed, and injustice. They demand our time and our energies, but before we can give ourselves to bringing about equality, before we can enter the work of transformation in our world, we need to regularly engage in self-examination. In these days, it is easy for us to also look at how others are not following orthodox or orthopathic ways. And then we tend to point out those people or groups of people who are perpetrating the problems in this world. But the bigger challenge comes when we stop and ask, how am I contributing to this problem? How can I blend my belief, my actions, and my heart so that, the lo so that love reigns? And so let's commit. Commit, yes, to choose love, but commit to support one another in this challenging yet rewarding work of love. Amen.
Let us pray. Ever-present God, you have shown us the way of life through Jesus Christ, but we have added yokes difficult to carry and burdens great to bear. We have made the way you taught us into a list of rules to obey and turned away from your free gift of love and created a monster of wrath to fear. Forgive us for putting you in a box. Forgive us for telling others that inside the box is a monster. Forgive us for causing fear and harm to others instead of revealing the truth. Your love is free through Christ Jesus our Lord. Call us to turn back to your way of love, to seek the well-being of our neighbors, and to truly love them as ourselves so we may love you more fully. In the name of Christ, who has shown us the way and the truth and the life, hear us now as we join in praying the prayer that Jesus taught his followers to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So my friends, as we come to this time in worship where we give of our tithes and our offerings or that we, as the plate go by, remember that we have given online or uh, in other ways this week, I pray that, that you will experience the integration of, of head um, giving the physical part of action and also your heart. We do this so that those around the world, people and our neighbors near and far, can experience God's love and grace in their lives.
God, we are so grateful that you love us, not just for our brains and for our heads, but that we are created in your image, body, mind, and spirit. And so as we live and breathe and move, we desire that we also give from our hearts and not just from our heads. And so may these gifts be used so that our neighbors near and far can experience that integrated love that you gave to us, that you give to all of us. Because of Jesus, I pray. Amen. I invite you to remain standing as we sing our closing hymn this morning, Sent Forth by God's Blessing. day and into your week being aware of God's love for you. Know that God loves you body, mind, and spirit and will empower you to love your neighbors near and far. Amen. Amen.